This is Conversations on Discipleship with Father Adam Streitenberger from St. Gabriel Catholic Radio and Diocese of Columbus Media. I'm your host, Father Adam Streitenberger. With me today are Deacon Eric Wright and his wife, Maggie. Welcome. Great Welcome. to have you. Thank you. They're both from um, St. Francis de Sales Parish in Newark, Ohio. And longtime friends, so it's great to have you. Um, Maggie has been on Conversations on Discipleship before when we did a tour um, out to St. Francis. She's on the staff there, um, but this is the first time for Deacon. But before we do anything else, let's start with a prayer in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for Eric and Maggie, and we just ask that you bless them, bless their family. Um, we ask, O oh Lord, that you bless each of us, that as, um, as they share their stories with us, um, we might come to a deeper knowledge and love of you, O oh Lord. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. So, um, Eric, um, to start with you, Deacon Eric, Deacon Wright, um, what, um, you know, like, so as we always do with conversations on discipleship, we, we like to start with someone's conversion story, how they came to know the Lord. And so maybe you could share um, share your story with us. Yeah, sure will. So uh, first, thanks for having us. Um, so a little bit of background where I come from. I come from a family of uh, five children growing up. Uh, and then when I was about 10 or 11, my parents uh, divorced. And so, you know, at that time, never went to church, just va- vacation Bible school weekly, or I mean yearly. And, uh, you know, so the, on Sundays, it was just another day. So... Um, you know, I've always believed in God and Jesus, but never really practiced any religion. So that went on through my teen years, and and uh, then I decided to go ahead and join the military. And uh, so in the military, that's not a priority either. Only in basic training, because we go to we'd go to regular church on Sundays in basic training just to get out of training and having to clean up the barracks and and uh, you know the, the the chores and the uh, duties around there. So. Um, yeah, so starting after basic training, um, never really got into church, never always knew there was, you know, a God and just but never really practiced anything there either. So so all the way up until uh probably about twenty four, twenty five years old, really had no interest uh in religion. And then slowly, uh, once Maggie and I got married, she wasn't practicing at the time, uh but slowly, things started to change for us. You know, her mother um, had a big influence, uh, now that I look back, but her mother um, got sick with cancer uh, for the second time. And she, during this whole time that she had cancer, um, she faithful Catholic, and she was always cho- you know, cheerful, joyful, um, just all around, just always happy, it seemed like, even though she was going through all this uh, you know, this, this cancer, uh, uh, stuff. And, and it just, you know, that was, I think the beginning where the flame started for me, it, even though it was a small, very small flame, but I think that started where, you know, just wearing me down, um, and letting that guard down. And from there, you know, we still, we went to mass a couple times with her and, and then, uh, you know, unfortunately she passed away, uh, shortly after that. But, uh, just just seeing her, how she interacted with with Tony at the time, you know, one child that we had, and at the time, and and just her faith in in our Lord, and never giving up, and just always giving him, you know, praise and 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 uh, continually going to mass. So so that had that had some stuff that you know it, it started the, the ball rolling. But then we they eventually uh, we moved up to Dayton, and. Tony went to, uh, we went to St. Saint Fra- uh, Saint, uh, Peter's. St. Peter's, yeah. Yeah, St. Yeah. Peter's in, in Huber Heights. And, you know, we were involved a little bit of the church. Uh, Tony was involved uh, with the soccer at the school and stuff like that. So eventually uh, I got to know this uh, retired priest there. Uh, he, he was about 80 years old, um, just a gruffy, you know, old priest. Uh, and his... You know, at the masses and stuff, uh, his homilies they were they were very monotone. So this guy seemed like he had no personality whatsoever. He was just uh, just you know just a 
but I come to find out he's a great guy. He's a really good guy to talk with outside of outside of his uh, preaching. Uh, so eventually, I had just one day, I said, I'm going to RCIA uh, just to see what it's about, you know, just to, because that seemed like the next logical step for me was let's go find out what's going on here. So uh, so I went, yeah, me and a buddy of mine went to RCIA. We both came into the church in 2001 at Easter time. And, and uh, you know, things since then has been, it's been crazy. But unfortunately, that uh, Father Reese uh, passed away like a year later, so, uh, but I, I owe a lot to him, so, and then, you know, from that point on, it's just going to Mass and, and learning more and more, uh, was I on fire? Not really, you know, but I wanted to learn more, um, and then around 2009, I started thinking about the diaconate, and at the time, my oldest son, our oldest son was in the, in the seminary, and, and, uh, Father Stephen Smith now was there at the rectory at St. Francis, and I said, guys, What's, you know, tell me about the diaconate, you know, tell me about being a deacon, and, and then I, you know, I talked to Father Bob Penhollerick, and, and we just, it just started going from there, and, uh, it's, um, you know, uh, formation, you know, I put it off for a while, because we had, we have seven children, so, um, you know, it's, it's kind of hard to, to start that formation with young children, now, at that time, they were young, uh, so, yeah, so from there, it just, you know, got into formation in 2018 and, and got ordained in 20, uh, November of 20. Excellent. You know, so um, you, you mentioned, you, you know, um, you came from a divorced family and, um, you know, one of five kids. What was your relationship with um, your parents after it, at the time, I was I was so young. I really didn't know what divorce meant. I knew my, you know, uh, I stayed with my dad. My my youngest sister and I stayed with with him, but the other three went with my mom. And for me, it was like, well, you know, that's, I didn't really know what was going on. Um, it was from I, I was confused. Didn't really know how things would work. Or you know, I'd go visit her every two weeks, and when I went there, you know, it was a blast. But I would always come home to my dad where it was safe and, you know, and stable uh, mm -hmm. to where, you know, when I was with her, it just, you know, everything, everything was a go. You know, if I wanted to do it, just do it because there was only two or three days that we were with her. And, you know, so she didn't want to, you know, she didn't want to upset us or say no to us. So, and, and, you know, I mean, the thing is, is like, is your background is very similar to so many Americans, you know, that. Maybe, um, you know, when we talk about the seculars and nons is, you know, oftentimes, you know, so many people now are from divorced families, you know, where they don't have contact with maybe even, you know, um, one or the other of their parents. But, you know, so I guess, you know, with that in mind, you know, how was like the concept of religion or, or God, you know, how did that kind of how was that planted in your life even then, though? You know, like, was, you know, you went to vacation Bible school once a year. I mean, was there any kind of conversation about God? Or, you know, as maybe as, as often asked as, how would you have seen God um, in those, you know, like in your childhood and as you were growing up? Uh, up until they got divorced, there wasn't any. I mean, just like BBS, and that was it, you know. Um, and I don't ever remember God being mentioned in our house, uh, you know, only in front of a cuss word. But that's about the only <laughs> time. So, uh, but once, when they got divorced, uh, my mother got remarried right away. And then my father eventually remarried with a lady that he, re he married was a good Christian lady. So it started coming that way. So she started, you know, she would go to church every weekend. And she would, you know, you'd see her reading her Bible or Bible verses and, so it was slowly, it, you know, I slowly got introduced that way, and and you know, being the teenager that I was, really kind of, you know, nah, that's, I don't need that that sort of stuff. But you know, I, I it, it may have planted a seed or two in there, and I, I may have gotten something out of it. I just don't want to admit it, you know, at that time as a teenager. Mm -hmm. No, nah, I don't need that, you know. So, in the military, did you have interaction with chaplains or? Uh, only only during basic training. Yeah. Um, you know, so really I didn't step into a chapel until, from after basic training, I didn't step until probably uh, when her mom at her funeral. Mm. 
Because we, you know, we'd go to mass Christmas. with him, but well, yeah, Christmas. He, he would well, go yeah, on go Christmas, Christmas and time. Easter and sit in the back and be the one that volunteered to go get the pizza. Mm. So he got to leave early. Yeah. Well, I put yeah. under the guise of standing, you know, so somebody else could sit down. So, yeah. <laughs> but I could go get the pizza afterwards. So yeah. So it, yes. That's, now, how did you two meet? Ooh. Uh, so, <laughs> you well, just asked a loaded question. Yeah, well, not, not really. So um, I was stationed down at, at Eglin at, in Destin, Florida, there at Fort Walton Beach, and go out to nightclubs, and that's where we met. Uh, was at a nightclub. Yeah. You know, not <laughs> That's what we did on weekends. And, uh, you know, she uh, she was over across the room, and, and a buddy of mine and I were there, and I said, hey, why don't you go ask her to dance with me? And go. Mm. The rest is history. Yeah, there's a lot there. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, you know, it's interesting. So your your conversion, but also, and, and we'll hear this in the next segment, but even really Maggie's reconversion was really after your your marriage, your wedding. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, so it's, that's also another, you know, really interesting thing is mm -hmm. to see a couple, you know, come to know the Lord after they've started this life together. Um, so often I think, you know, we talk about in college years or, you know, pre-marriage that that conversion happens. So, you know, um, in our next segment, we'll hear um, about Maggie's own story as well. So Maggie, um, in our last segment, we heard from your wonderful husband, um, Eric, about his own story, you know, kind of how he came to know the Lord which was largely, it, it seems, at least through his relationship with you. Mm -hmm. So in order for us to fully understand Eric's story, we kind of have to hear your story. So could you share with us how you came to know the Lord? Well, I grew up Catholic. Um, my parents were great, um, went to Mass every, you know, every Sunday, did the, you know, um, and we never missed Mass, um, but we didn't pray a lot at home either. Um, I went to CCD. That's where I learned the faith from, and that stopped um, when I was quite young. Not because my parents wanted it to stop, but because I refused as I became a teenager to go anymore. I never got confirmed, um, which is a shame at that point. Um, I just didn't believe, you know, and was pretty much had more of an atheistic type of point of view. Um, Fast forwarding later, when Eric and I married, I was still the atheist. He was pretty much the agnostic, and so that fit well. We did go to, to church with my mom when she wanted to, you know, to, to Easter and Christmas to do that Easter and Christmas duty. Yes, we were them, the Christers. <laughs> and um, we did do that to satisfy her, um, but pretty much that was that was it. And, you know, I only did it because she wanted me to go there. Um, I kind of had just an inward conversion where I looked in the mirror one day and realized I was not who and what I wanted to be. And now I'm watching my mother in her illness. Um, it was an amazing thing to watch because you couldn't tell she was ill. She was sick with cancer. She had metastasized cancer from the breast to the liver and she'd actually been told she'd only had three months to live but she ended up living another three years she told the doctor he didn't know what he was talking about he said she said only oh, god decides that um so she lived her her suffering was like very joyful and i remember watching that that was an amazing thing to watch and i know that eric said several times your mom doesn't even act like she's sick you know um and then after she died I do know that in the process as she was passing away that I remember for the first time ever saying a prayer and asking God, you know, if you really do exist, she needs you right now. Um, so if you, ex you really do exist, let her die at home like she wanted to die at home. And he made that happen. Um, so that was a, it was a beautiful day. My mother was, um, her name was Mary and she was born on December 8th and she passed away on August 15th, 1995. Um, after that, um, Eric and I pretty much continued to flail. <laughs> uh, when you, when you experience marriage under a sacrament, it is so different than experiencing marriage outside of the sacraments. And, um, there's been times I've looked at friends of mine who have grown up 
you know, Catholic, and they started in their college years, and they prayed together, and they went to Mass together. That wasn't Eric and I at the beginning, you know. Um, our marriage really took off the minute we both had our conversions. Um, so I had that inward conversion during that time, and we actually both started looking at faith, and we'd gone to a couple different you know, churches, not necessarily the Catholic church. Uh, one was a Baptist church, wasn't it? And a Methodist church. And um, as when we came up to Dayton, I told Eric, I said, you know, I, uh, I had a Jewish woman that kind of challenged me once. And she said, if you, you know, um, she said, you made a promise to raise your son Catholic, which I did. I kind of lied and did everything I could to have him baptized Catholic because that's what my mother wanted um, but she said, you made a covenant with God and, you know, tell a fundamentalist Christian that, and they suddenly go, Oh, covenant. I made a covenant with God that I would, you know, raise him Catholic, mm. but I'm going, I don't believe what Catholics believe. And she said, have you ever read the catechism? This was a Jewish woman. And I said, no. And so her response to me was, I have, and I find nothing objectionable. And until you've read the catechism, I don't see how you can reject the faith of your birth. So I actually started going to an RCIA class at Eglin Air Force Base just to kind of prove her wrong. I was going to go find out, you know, what I was rejecting so that I could continue to reject it, I guess. I don't know. It was kind of silly. Um, God in his providence, in the midst of that, I started out the RCIA class there. But in this providence, we had a hurricane that hit and a tornado that flew over our house. And the first phone call that happened after the electric came back on was a phone call, somebody offering him a job mm. to come to Dayton, Ohio. And he hadn't even applied for it. So we came. And when we came here, that's when I went to Father Reese at St. Peter's. And I asked him, you know, I want to join your RCA class. And he told me I had to redo all the classes I had missed, which I was pretty angry about. Mm. Um, but I did it. I'm very glad I did. It's the best thing I ever did. Um, when I came back into the church, one of the things that he said to me was, if you want your husband to be Catholic, well, he actually asked me, do you want him to be Catholic? Do you want him to come and you know, be a part of your faith? And I said, of course I do. And he said, good, then you need to shut your mouth. <laughs> and, and, and I'm like, what? <laughs> you know? And so he gave me a novena to St. Joseph. So for two years, I prayed that novena. He said, I wasn't allowed to say anything. I had to get up, just go to Mass, you know, take my son. If Eric joined me, great. If he didn't join me, that's fine. And one day after dinner, feast of St. Joseph the worker, my husband gets up, and I said, where are you going? And he says, well, Mark and I decided we're going to go check out Father Reese's RCA class. Mm. And I said, oh, that's good. And he left, and I was doing cartwheels through the mm. house after that, so. Beautiful. Do, um, you know, I um, one of the, the things that kind of struck me in your testimony, which, you know, um, Eric did not include in his, but is, so you were an atheist, mm -hmm. and he was kind of an agnostic. Did you guys have any conversation about God or religion while you were dating? I think you knew I didn't believe. I mean... Very little. Yeah, very little. Yeah. I mean, just... And it, so you know, it's it's interesting how how much uh, or how little religion is kind of talked about in the dating process, mm -hmm. or you know, can very often not be mentioned at all, even from you know from people who have a religious identity, you know, that are practicing. You know that I um, there's been several people I run into is like, well, I didn't really realize. The, um, what denomination they were until we started talking about when we were going to get married. And I'm like, all those years of dating and it, you know, the conversation was brought up. It's striking, but, um, you know, I think in, in your experience with your mother and, and, you know, maybe you could elaborate a little bit more on this too, is, you know, you mentioned she, her name was Mary mm -hmm. and yeah. she was born on the Immaculate Conception, died on the Assumption. The role the role of Our Lady in your own conversion. Oh, she was very much... Uh, um, so my mother, when, when I walked into that RSA class there at Eglin Air Force Base, there was a deacon there that I had known when I was a child, Deacon Jensen, and he jumped up and says, oh, 
I know why you're here. And I'm like, uh, why am I here? You know, I'm going, oh, goodness. Um, he said, you're here because your mother offered all of her suffering on earth for your conversion and the conversion of your husband. And I was like kind of astounded at that declaration that mm. he made with me. Um, I later found out that my mother had consecrated, not only after my birth, consecrated me to the Blessed Mother, but she had also made the Montfort consecration herself. And one of the things that my father brought up to me after I had come back to the church was that her book, and there was a card that she had always had by the statue of Mary, and I never looked in it before, but it was her written out, handwritten consecration and her consecration of us like re-consecrating us to Mary. Um, and it was one year before she died that she did that. So I knew in that that she had, you know, really interceded for me. And so then I started reading about the consecration myself. And that was just, that was monumental for me. I mean, I, I can see Mary's role in my life every step of the way. And she has done so much for me. And yeah in and then you guys at some point moved from the Dayton area to Newark is yeah that right yeah we did what was the um was there a reason for that move or just oh, job well, or yeah um the first time we were actually looking to move to the the Newark area he'd gotten offered a job here and I remember praying something felt a little uneasy about it even though I'd come and visited the parish and I thought oh it's a great place to be um, and so I asked Our Lady, I, you know, if, if this is the wrong thing, then let him come in and express doubt today. And he, who had been so, we're moving, we're moving, we're moving, came in and expressed doubt. And so, which I was a little disappointed about. <laughs> I'm like, okay. Five years later, um, he got offered another job, which was an even better job. And then we came to Newark, Ohio, so, which was being at St. Francis was a, a, an amazing thing. So Yeah, and it was there that, you know, your most of your children, I think, were brought in. Mm -hmm. yeah. And um, the two of you have kind of been pillars there for a long time. When did you start on the staff at St. Francis? Um, 2016, November of 2016. Yeah. I and actually then, left a job at Intuit to go to And work. then, Dee, can you do your work at Resurrection? Is that right? No. You don't. Oh, okay. That no, was no, no, they, <laughs> no. Re, resur, uh, Church of the Resurrection was my internship oh, okay. when I was in formation. Okay. I worked for the government. I worked for the Air Force oh, okay. at the old Air Force base in Newark. Okay, good. And on the weekends, you're at St. Francis. Yes. Okay, great, great. So, um, Deacon and Maggie, I wanted to talk to you about um, your family and about... Um, you know, um, how you have kind of made Christ more the center of your family. Um, families are so important, especially for the handing on of the faith. I think an interesting thing about your relationship is is that it, it didn't begin as two religious people, you know. Mm -hmm. And in fact, it wasn't even um, a Catholic wedding no, originally. No, no. How did you get your uh, your your marriage kind of recognized? So you were a Catholic, Maggie, and raised a Catholic, so you were bound by form. You had to yep. get married in a Catholic ceremony. There weren't any prior bonds or anything like no. that. Mm -mm. So w what was the process like to get your marriage um, as a sacrament? Father Reese did it for us. In fact, I, I went to Eric and I told him, I said, in order for me to come into the church and to be where I want to be, I need you to do this. So Eric was like, okay, you know, as long as he didn't have to do it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, did they do a ceremony? And Yeah, yeah, we did it in the little chapel there. Um, and and it, it's funny because my older son was there, Tony. Uh, <laughs> now, you mentioned that you sensed a real difference in your marriage prior to it being a sacrament. And that yes. there really is a different. Could you, you know, maybe elaborate a little bit on what what does that feel like or look like? Um, oh, I hope I can get do this justice. So before we had our marriage um, recognized as a sacrament, 
the way that we lived our life was different, but also the way that we related to each other was different. Um, you know, just in, in our marriage and then the way that we treated each other and um, seeing it as a permanent thing, as a commitment to each other. You know, um, we were so... You know, li living a, a sacramental marriage is so different because you have God, you have Jesus right there in the midst with you, helping you every step of the way. Marriage is marriage is not a a cakewalk, no matter what, and even the best of couples, you know, um, have struggles. But when you have Christ with you during those struggles, when you are our experience struggles with, with him there, it makes a huge difference. Um, well, yeah. And you have, you have to ask for the help too. Yeah. Um, you know, God can be present and, you know, but you have to ask our, you know, ask our Lord, come in, help us, be with us, help us get through this. And mm -hmm. it makes a huge difference where before, you know, we, we would argue or whatever. And then, there was nothing, you know, so, uh, now, you know, we pray and, and, uh, it's easier to forgive too, a lot yeah, quicker than, than just trying to do it on my own, yeah. especially for me, you know, I have a hard time forgiving people, but, uh, I, you know, I, I, I take it to our Lord real quick and say, help me get through this. And uh, it, it helps me a lot. I'm oh, sorry. Yeah. Oh no, no, go. You go to confession, you know, and then, then you're able, once you reconcile with Jesus then you're able to you know, walk back to your spouse and, and work on that reconciliation together. I and mean, we, we had some pretty difficult times after that, but I think that if we'd have done that, if they would have happened during the time of our secular marriage, I don't, I don't know that we would have survived because we lost three children during that time. You know, we buried three children. And, um, yeah, I just, he was always with us during that. There was always hope. When... Um when you entered into a sa the sacrament of marriage um, and through the convalidation um, in a ceremony, did you go in there with an openness to life? Had you always kind of been have you had you been converted at that point to the church's teaching on um, you know this um, that the marital act be open open so to children? Prior oh. coming to faith, I just didn't think I could have any more. I really only wanted my two point one children, you know, as they say, and that would be enough. Um, Eric was always open to life. I don't think that you were ever, but I, we never, I don't know, I guess God graced us because we never, um, we just didn't think we could have them. We, we just didn't get pregnant. Um, but once we, um, once I came back to faith and once we came into the sacrament of marriage together. We opened ourselves to God, and I just told him, I'm open to whatever you give us. You know, and so we, we both did that. We just said, we're, we're willing to take whatever you give us. And he took us at our words, too. I'm telling you. Mm -hmm. So seven living children later and four that, yeah. So. Yeah, at that time, uh, after, our, after our marriage uh, got recognized in the church and that sacrament, you know, one of the things I did was I prayed for patience. And that's when we started having many children. <laughs> and so, so yeah, I, I don't pray for patience anymore. So, uh, but I was, I've always been open to children. I yeah. can have as many as I, you know, as we can have. I, I am the more the merrier. Yeah. Uh, We've never used birth control. Yeah, We've never, never did. we, we, we didn't even do natural family planning. We just said we're open to whatever it is that mm. you choose. And he did take us at our word with that. Yeah. And we were always blessed. We never went without. You know, every time, every time we got a, got pregnant, you know, Eric would get a raise <laughs> or something. And in fact, I think with what was it, Robert? I'm going. All right, Lord, where's the raise? It's not here yet. You know, like, <laughs> so, um, clothes would just show up in the van. People would, you know, and we we just learned very much to trust him, and trust our fertility to him, and just let him take it from there. And and with children, you know, um, the raising of your children as Catholics, um, you know, what what are some lessons that you've learned on the way, or or kind of, you know, like if someone was asking, you know, how do how do I raise my children Catholic? Mm -hmm. What are s some lessons that you've discovered along the way? Consistency, uh, mm -hmm. be consistent. You know, mass every week and explain it to them. 
uh, you know, we just didn't go to mass and not say anything to them about it. And we always talked about it every day, something different. Uh, you know, Maggie uh, homeschooled for a while, and, and they would incorporate that into their, their daily uh, uh, schoolwork. So just more of, of living it every day um, and, and talking to them, explaining to them, and, and you know, pray, uh, pray with them, even if it's just at meals, you know, pray with them as a family. Uh, and, and you know, prayer, prayer is important. And they need to see their parents doing it. If you, you know, if they, if you expect them to stay with the faith, they got to see you doing it because that then it's important to you, you know. And they may make it a priority also, uh, or you know, they're more apt to make it a priority. So for me, consistency, you know, always, always living your faith every day, uh, not just on Sundays. And they need to be able to experience Jesus, experience Jesus through you. And you can't take for granted that somebody else is going to tell them. You know, even even in today's world, which can be so confusing with my teenagers, I always look at them and say, okay, so do you see the fallacy in that? Let's talk about this. And, and, they, and they do, um, and we have real honest conversations so that they're able to see and bring their faith into it. But then you also give them opportunities to experience Jesus, um, whether it be through prayer or you know, and there's other outside things. There's things like Damascus. There's, you know, the things at the church. And um, for my children, being at the, the church was a normal part. It was a part of our life. You know, it's just, I don't think that they would think any different. Not, no, not even today. So they, you know, they, they know where I'm at. If I'm not at home, they know, you know, I'm at the church doing something. Usually I'll have one or two of them with me, mm -hmm. uh, you know, for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. And yeah, they don't have any any problems staying at the church, hanging out with us, and you know, just you know, youth groups, whatever. So they're very involved, and and they want to be involved. What about family prayer? How have you integrated that? Um, obviously, you know, children have to kind of learn their prayers, mm -hmm. and you know, certainly there's times like Sunday mass, but also at meals where we pray. But how have you taught your children how to pray? So we. we um, the family rosary, and then, of course, Eric prefers the Divine Mercy Chaplet because he's a little ADD there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's a little easier. Um, um, just praying, every, just normal prayer, you know. Well, let's pray about that, honey. You know, kids need to, to feel, they come to you with a problem or they, you know, I've got a test tomorrow, so let's pray about that. Let's pray about your test. And, oh, I prayed for you, and I'll, I'll send a little text. I prayed for you today. I prayed for your your success with this. Or I remember you had a problem with this person. How did it go? I was praying for you. Um, kind of giving them that opportunity of knowing the saints. You know, what saint to call on? What, you know, we, we always kept plenty of sacramentals around the house, um, things like that. You've got to make it natural. It doesn't have to be um, totally formal. Although when they were younger, we always gathered the neighborhood kids. And my kids, I always allowed them to invite them in. And it's funny because Grace will tell you, who is our middle school youth minister, she remembers that the majority of those kids who were not Catholic knew how to pray the Hail Mary, and they knew how to pray at Rosary. They knew how to yeah. Pray. yeah. So, yeah. Well, and, and, you know, I think that the two things that really strike me, one is, um, as you say, we can't, you know, we have to tell the story to them and mm -hmm. not let someone else be the one to tell the story. Um, you, we can control, in that sense, control that narrative. Yeah. Um, we can't control it forever, but we can at least be the ones that first tell, tell them the story of Christ and, you know, kind of the biblical worldview. But then the other two, like with friends, is, you know, uh, parents are always a little nervous about the neighborhood kids, whether they're going to be bad influences or not. Well, you can always turn bad influences into good influences mm -hmm. by yep. being that good influence. So I wanted to talk to you guys also about um, ministry and um, deacon. You know, you, you're a deacon. You have this um, diaconal ministry. Um, Maggie, you work for the church mm -hmm. um, in um, what is... what? I'm the director of finance and development for yeah, St. Francis Finance Sales. and development. So... Um, both and you're both highly involved in the parish and in other works and apostolates. But I guess the first question is um, maybe to Maggie: Is what's it like being married to a deacon, or what's it like being a deacon wife? Um, to be honest, 
it doesn't feel any different than it did before, except for when we go to things and I realize that he's up on the altar and stuff like that. But um, for me, it's no different when, because he's, when he first told me he was going to go into the diaconate, I wasn't surprised because that's all he's ever done is serve. I mean, even, you know, they say, you know, Christ can build on nature even in um, the days where he was away from God and agnostic, he was a server. He was one that just loved people and would always try to serve and help. So, yeah. And what's it like being um, the um, director of finance and development's husband? Challenging. <laughs> 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 yeah, and, and I only say that because I mean she does, she knows what she's doing. Great job. She did, you know does really well uh, at the church. Um, it, it, sometimes it can be a challenge though. Uh, with both of us being at the church, can be a challenge. Mm-hmm. So I I try to make the separation. You know when I'm there, uh, you know doing something with ministry or something, and you know she's over in another building. So I you know it, it's it that works that way being separated there, but bringing it home with her. Uh, that's, yeah. you know, so sometimes I have to remind her, Maggie, you're not at work, you know, mm-hmm. and so, and the same with me, you know, she needs to remind me sometimes, you know, hey, this is family time, and so it, it can be a challenge sometimes getting that balance, uh, you know, for her to, you know, with family, and even though you're home, you're not sometimes, and so, uh, but I, she she does great for the church, she's, uh, church is very blessed to have somebody, you know, with finance, you know, I, I'm terrible with, with, <laughs> with numbers and, and money and all that. Do our so, too. Yeah, she does, you know, like, hey, I'm, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm <laughs> humble enough here, take it, you know, I, I know what I'd do with it, so versus her, so uh, it, it's a blessing, though, really, to, to have her at the church, and I can just, you know, her office is across the street from, you know, we have Faith, uh, Faith and Family Center, and then we have uh, the, the uh, Johnson Hall. Well, her office um, is on the corner, and her view, she has the best view in the world. Oh, but you stop. It, it, it looks right into my office <laughs> so she can see me yeah. at, at my desk. That's working. good. Don't so, even call me. Don't you enjoy your view? I, I, I bet you, and I bet that was intended. It was. Yeah. <laughs> God had his hand in that. The, uh, so what what do you do as a deacon? Uh, many things. First, you know, uh, mass. Um, uh, I serve at the mass. and, and uh, So that, that's, just, that's just a small part of it. Uh, I've been able to do baptisms. Uh, marriages, um, and then vigil services at funerals, and and then the committals. Uh, so I can do pretty much uh, Father Dave Sizemore. He lets me do pretty much everything a deacon can do. Uh, you know, preaching and mm-hmm. and uh, all that, which is you know that can be a challenge sometimes, homilies and and that. But uh, outside the church, though, I have other ministries. Also, one of them is is uh, outreach to the poor. Uh, and that was started uh, several years ago. Uh, two ladies uh, from the parish started going out on a golf cart just around town, just around the square, just handing out water. And then eventually I said, hey, let's hand out sandwiches. So I started going with them, and that's just, that's blossomed. Uh, and that's the one I'm most excited about is going out and into the into the community. Uh, we have a golf cart now that's, you know, a really nice one. And, and we'll go out into the community and, and just, serve whoever you know we'll go down go down the road and somebody's there hey would you like a water would you like a sandwich or, you know uh, most of them are poor most of them are homeless also um so you know it, it's kind of scary at first but you know once we get out there and uh, and get and interact with these people it's beautiful uh you know these people are beautiful people the homeless people they're just you know they they were in a bad situation and and couldn't get out of it and, and unfortunately it, it landed them where they're at um so we go out, I don't know, two, three, four times a week, just little things, and sitting there and praying with them, and just being somebody there for them to show them that you know somebody does love them, and somebody does care for them, that you know that they're not lost to the world. So uh, I enjoy it. That's that's my most exciting part uh, of ministry. He's very natural at it, and it's it's they flock to him. They they know him. They trust him. They, um, and and he's so. Er- you know, he doesn't, you know, even during COVID, you know, we weren't supposed to be touching words, but Eric would never take his hand back. Eric mm-hmm. would always hug. Eric would always give his hand. He would never wear a mask, any of that, because he wasn't in any way going to make them feel bad. Mm-hmm. 
you know, if they wanted to hug him, if they wanted to come near him, he he would still do it. He would just, he you just know, was he with treats the them. Yeah. <laughs> just, yeah. Just, it's amazing to watch because he's so, so good and so loving. And I think some of his upbringing makes it, they all, he relates so well. Mm. Yeah. And you, I mean, in the ancient church, we're not quite sure um, all that, de- what that deacons did, but we do know that they helped out at the altar. And we also know that they worked with the poor. And it really, those really are kind of the two hinges of mm-hmm. um, the life of a deacon. And, you know, what about um, poverty in Newark? I mean, you know, obviously it's everywhere, poverty and homelessness. And um, is, it, is, it a, is it a particularly rough problem in Newark? Or? I didn't realize how bad homelessness was until we started this ministry and going out and actually seeing it. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, it's bad. There's a lot of homeless in Newark and, you know, and I'm sure Columbus has their, their fill too, but in Newark, there's probably, I see when I go out probably 50 to 60 people uh, evening and with the other people that go out on the golf cart also, that's probably what they see too, uh, roughly. Um, Poverty is, is, is bad. I mean, it's, it, it's getting worse. We, I talked to a lady this morning um, and prayed with her. She, you know, she can't afford rent anymore. Uh, there's people all the time that the, the, another gentleman I talked to, he said his rent for, went from 700 to to $1,000. Well, he's on disability, so he can't afford that. So what's he going to do? You know, so, you know, he'll end up, hopefully, you know, he'll end up with a friend or a family member that he can stay with and that. So, yeah. Yeah, poverty is, uh, I'm seeing more of it. Well, when I go out on the golf cart, I see people I don't, I've never seen before. And we also, you know, we uh, we get calls from people for help uh, through Catholic Outreach Ministry, that the ministry at St. Francis. Uh, and we're getting more and more calls, and, and the people that run it, they do a wonderful job with that, trying to get people help and, and getting them in the right direction. Wonderful. And Maggie, you, um, you know, I mean, obviously, finance and development is a ministry, especially for parishes and doing that. But um, you, too, are involved in so much more than just Mm -hmm. the mere job at at the parish. Oh, yeah. No, I go out with Eric um, just so that we can do that together because I enjoy doing it. But um, I do... I am actually a Metanoia Catholic trained um, coach. So I do that, and I meet with... He is different than a spiritual director. I'm not a spiritual director. Um, but I do help people um, show them their mind and help them to jumpstart reason and help them to, to um, work through things. Uh, Catholic coaches, they're, they're starting to pop up all over the place. And I went through a place called Metanoia Catholic. They're out of Steubenville, or at least they were out of Steubenville. They're now down at Ave Maria, um, down in that area. But um, it, it was a good training, so I do that. Um, in addition, I serve. I served at the rescue project. Just I, I like to serve, so I served um, just helping around, um, you know, as an usher and things like that. I, I love uh, working with the faith formation side of the church. So yeah. you're also a secular Franciscan. Yes, I am. I am a secular Franciscan. How do you um, incorporate? You know, kind of integrate Franciscan spirituality into your work and life in the parish and. Um, oh, I think it's just a natural thing. You know, everybody knows that I'm a Franciscan and we're very much, um, you know, we live a life that is based on poverty and humility and simplicity. Um, and so we try to work that in, in everything that we do. And so that's, yeah. The, um, you know, I think too, you know, with Franciscan spirituality, it is so gospel centered yes. and Christ centered that, you know, it, you know, yeah, simplicity and humility and penance and some of these themes, which really are, you know, general themes, but um, it, you know, as a, as a fellow secular Franciscan too, you know, um, you know, it is, it seems to me it's, it's very usable and, and doable in the mm-hmm. life of the parish. Oh, yeah. And well, and then in every decision you make, Jesus has to be there in the center of it. And so you start your day in prayer and in prayer with him and in looking, you know, face to face with him so that you can carry it throughout the day. You know, um, and Jesus has been very good to me, I have to say. 
Um, it's hard when you're a finance person and you're making decisions because a lot of times your mind wants to go kind of like Matthew, the tax collector and that legalistic mm -hmm. type thing. And that's where you have to bring the eyes of Jesus into whatever it is you're doing. When you're doing finances for a parish, it is so totally different than doing them for the world. Yeah. So, yeah. Amen. Well, thank you guys so much for joining us. Um, you've been listening to Conversations on Discipleship. I'm your host, Father Adam Streitenberger. With me has been Deacon Eric Wright and Maggie Wright, both from St. Francis de Sales in Newark. Um, again, thank you so much. And until next time, peace and all good. A Diocese of Columbus production in partnership with St. Gabriel Catholic Radio.